Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. This is part two of our autumn installment of Unearthed. We have lots of many folks' favorite things today. We are going to kick off, as we so often do, with things that were interesting but hard to categorize. So I threw them together and called it potpourri. And potpourri starts with controversy. Uh, In September, a paper called A Tunguska-Sized Airburst Destroyed Tal El Hammam, a Middle Bronze Age city in the Jordan Valley near the Dead Sea. That was published in the journal Scientific Reports. This paper makes the case that a cosmic airburst caused by a comet or meteorite destroyed the city around 1650 BCE. It also notes debate about whether Tal el Hammam may have been the biblical city of Sodom, and the paper's authors considered whether the biblical account of the destruction of the city of Sodom may have come from oral traditions about the destruction of Tal el Hammam. So this paper argues that this was a massive, incredibly destructive, high-temperature event, shattering the bones of the people who were killed, melting pottery and mud bricks, and creating a destruction layer really rich in charcoal in the archaeological record. There have been multiple Twitter threads by physicists, bioarchaeologists, and other experts questioning or criticizing various aspects of this paper, like that there really wasn't a lot of bone used in the research and that the researchers were not sure whether the bones that were studied were human or animal, or that the way the mud brick had fragmented is really typical in other excavations of similar structures that are not suggested to have been destroyed in a massive air blast or that pottery being intermingled with mud brick isn't evidence that pottery was violently blasted into the walls. Pottery pieces were commonly used to help bind the brick. There's really a lot going on here, and some of the people involved with writing this paper definitely do believe that Tal el Hammam is the biblical city of Sodom, while a lot of the paper's critics definitely do not. Like, People were definitely coming from a perspective in both the paper and the criticism. And some of the critics have also concluded that this paper was written specifically to support the idea that Tal el Hammam was the city of Sodom, rather than drawing conclusions based on where the evidence actually led. There has even been criticism of this paper from biblical scholars and archaeologists who focus specifically on the Bible, because if Tal el Hammam really was destroyed in an air blast that happened as many as 400 years after the destruction of the city of Sodom is supposed to have happened, uh, this paper made a whole lot of headlines. And then I kept finding more and more Twitter threads from people who were like, nah. <laughs> It's honestly a level of, uh, like, criticism that I have more often seen associated with, like, a television show that's purportedly about archaeology rather than about a paper published in a peer-reviewed journal. Drama! That should actually be the television show, is the argument among experts. Yeah. Uh, Moving on... (laughs) Archaeologists in Gloucestershire working ahead of a new development have unearthed a number of objects, many of them dating back to Roman times, including a statuette believed to depict the goddess Venus. This piece is small. It's just about 17 centimeters tall, and it's made of pipe clay, and it's in very good condition. It was most likely worshipped as a religious icon, possibly at someone's home altar. Other finds at the area include the foundations of Roman-era buildings. Archaeologists in the Orkney Archipelago have unearthed two stone balls, each of them about the size of a cricket ball from a tomb there. This tomb dates back to about 3500 BCE, and it's currently being lost to erosion and sea level rise, Earlier excavations were carried out in the surrounding area back in the 1980s, but archaeologists have gone back to try to find as much as they can before this whole area is underwater. About 500 similar balls have been discovered in Scotland, and they seem to be unique to Scotland. 
Although there are several possibilities for how they were used, the most common is that they were throwing weapons. In terms of these two specific balls, one is intact, spherical, and polished, and the other has split. Moving on, when Europeans started arriving in North America in the 15th and 16th centuries, they, of course, brought lots of European goods with them. They brought their own supplies as well as trade goods and gifts. But for the most part, these goods were not evenly dispersed through the indigenous communities that Europeans came into contact with. Especially at first, Europeans tended to give them to or trade them with people they saw as being more elite, So today, archaeologists tend to find smaller numbers of European goods kind of clustered together in contexts that are associated with indigenous people of higher status, or at least indigenous people that Europeans would have interpreted as being of a higher status. That's not always the case, though. Researchers in Mississippi have found a trove of more than 80 metal objects that likely date back to Hernando de Soto's expedition through what is now the southeastern United States in the 16th century. In early 1541, de Soto demanded that the Chickasaw Nation provide him with hundreds of porters to help carry his expedition's supplies. He also demanded they supply him with women. This followed months of escalating tensions between DeSoto's expedition and the Chickasaw Nation, including DeSoto's execution of two Chickasaw people. So on March 4th, 1541, Chickasaw archers attacked DeSoto's encampment. DeSoto retreated and regrouped, but the Chickasaw attacked a second time, ultimately driving DeSoto out of the area entirely, in spite of the Chickasaw being heavily outnumbered. As DeSoto's force fled, they left behind all kinds of supplies, including metal chains that DeSoto had brought to shackle indigenous people with, including captives and people that the Spanish enslaved. There were also objects like axe heads, nails, and blades, which the Chickasaw recovered from the battlefield and repurposed for their own use, including reshaping metal objects and tools to more closely resemble their Chickasaw-made counterparts. Those were often made of bone, stone, or cane. In the words of lead author Charles Cobb, quote, one of the most stunning things we found is an exact iron replica of a Native American stone celt, or axe head, I've never seen anything like this in the Southeast before. The U.S. government removed the Chickasaw Nation from its traditional homeland to what's now Oklahoma in 1837. This find was part of archaeological work that started in Mississippi in 2015 at a site called Stark Farms, and the research was co-funded by the Chickasaw Nation and its Chickasaw Explorers Program. Fieldwork at Stark Farms was initially started in part to provide an archaeology fieldwork program for Chickasaw University students. The objects that were described in this paper, which was published in the journal American Antiquity in July, are being repatriated to the Chickasaw Nation. All right, let's move on to some more repatriations. In September, the Metropolitan Museum of Art announced that it would be returning a 10th century religious sculpture depicting Lord Shiva to Nepal. Researchers at the Met realized there were some holes in the sculpture's provenance and concluded that it had probably been stolen from Nepal about 50 years ago. A collection of 16th century manuscripts is being returned to Mexico from the United States after researchers in Mexico noticed a pattern of colonial-era documents being offered up for sale at U.S. auction houses. Mexican authorities started an investigation after seeing this pattern. These documents were stolen from Mexico's National Archive, possibly in a systematic series of thefts. An investigation and repatriation process was a joint effort involving the Mexican government, the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York, and Homeland Security Investigations, There was a formal repatriation ceremony for these documents in September. A pair of 18th century church doors was repatriated from Japan to Cyprus in September. The panel doors featured paintings of saints and religious scenes, and they were looted after Turkey invaded Cyprus in 1974. Legal efforts to have the doors returned had started in the 1990s, but at first, Japanese authorities maintained that they had been bought in good faith. And in our last repatriation, before we take a quick break, 
the Brooklyn Museum is repatriating more than 1,300 pre-Columbian artifacts to Costa Rica. These had been part of a collection belonging to railroad magnate Minor Keith, who owned banana plantations in Costa Rica. When workers on the plantations found artifacts, Keith just kept them. The museum bought some of the collection in 1934. Another part of the collection was given to the museum as a gift. Some of these repatriated objects are more than 2,000 years old. And now we'll pause for a quick sponsor break. Next up, we have a couple of things that aren't exactly discoveries, but they are papers that have uh, come out over the last few months, and they relate to how researchers approach the kind of work that we talk about on these episodes and the language that we use to talk about it. We've talked about discoveries made through remote sensing and non-invasive imaging technologies quite a few times, especially in the more recent installments of Unearthed. This can be a particularly useful method because it allows researchers to get a sense of what's under the ground or to get a clearer picture of the landscape without actually disturbing the area. But we haven't really talked about the ethics of this kind of work, and that's something that's discussed in a paper that was published in the journal Archaeological Prospection in July. Basically, while it's true that things like drone photography, satellite imagery, and light detection and ranging, or LIDAR, those are all considered non-invasive, using them doesn't eliminate the need for researchers to approach their work and the communities that they're studying in a respectful and ethical way. In the words of Penn State doctoral student Dylan Davis, quote, remote sensing is a tool and it can be used for great things or it can be used in ways that are extremely harmful. If you do not communicate what you are trying to do with these technologies with local communities, especially indigenous communities who may have been there for hundreds or thousands of years, the research you put together could tell a narrative that implicates them in something they are not responsible for. The paper's authors also note that the use of remote sensing doesn't absolve researchers of the need to get permission from indigenous communities to study their sacred spaces, even if they're not physically entering those spaces. Researchers using these technologies should also be aware of how their research could impact communities who are living in or connected to the spaces that are being studied through remote imaging. And for the other paper, something else that we've talked about in several previous episodes of the show is that race is socially constructed. Race and racism have had and continue to have real and dramatic effects on the world and on people's lives, but they're not actually based on biology. That can make it difficult to talk about research in a precise and accurate way, especially when that research is on the physical remains of people whose identities we don't necessarily know. In some cases, researchers have tried to frame their work in terms of people's places of origin rather than racial categories. So as a hypothetical example, a researcher describing remains that were found in a burial site might say that they were people of African descent rather than saying that they were Black in an effort to be more precise. But this may not be accurate either. Research published in the journal Biology examined the papers that were published in the Journal of Forensic Sciences between 2009 and 2019. So the focus here was on forensic anthropology. But the same concepts exist in other fields as well. Researchers evaluated papers that referenced things like ancestry and race to see if their authors were using their terminology consistently, and they weren't. In the words of lead author Anne Ross, quote, inconsistent terminology opens the door to confusion, misunderstanding, and misuse within the discipline. And the team also found that researchers' descriptions of remains as having an African, European, or Asian origin also were not always correct. And in some cases, these places of origin were basically being used as synonyms for race rather than actually correctly saying where a person had come from. 
There aren't necessarily any easy answers here, not within a field like forensic anthropology or even within something like our podcast, which is meant for a general audience made up of people from a variety of backgrounds. In the paper itself, the authors conclude, quote, we need a fundamental, structural, and thoughtful shift in our paradigm, beginning with hypotheses driven by meaningful questions and careful selection of informative characters for investigation. We need a return, or rather beginning, to investigate real human biological variation. Next up, we have a couple of exhumations to talk about. The body of Father Patrick Ryan was exhumed in July. Father Ryan was a Catholic priest who died in 1878 after contracting yellow fever while caring for people during a yellow fever epidemic. Once his coffin was opened, officials detected the presence of arsenic, which was used pretty often in embalming fluid at the time, hazardous materials specialists had to be brought in to transfer the remains to a newly built casket. A processional carried the casket to the Basilica of Saints Peter and Paul in Chattanooga, where it was re-entombed. Father Ryan has been given the title Servant of God, and his work is being investigated and researched in the process of his possibly being named a saint. In our other exhumation this time around, historians, history enthusiasts, and others in Ireland have called for the body of Irish Republican leader Michael Collins to be exhumed. Collins was shot and killed in August of 1922 when the convoy he was traveling in was ambushed. It's generally known that his assailants opposed the Anglo-Irish Treaty of December 1921, which Collins had helped negotiate. But beyond that, There was no formal inquiry, so very little is known about exactly what happened or who actually pulled the trigger. Advocates for exhuming his remains hope that it would yield some new information about his death. All right. Lots of favorites here. Shipwreck time. (laughs) Last year, we talked about a 17th century flout discovered in the Gulf of Finland. Divers had found this wreck while looking for ships from World War I and World War II. Based on markings on its transom, which were a picture of a swan and a year, this flout has now been identified as the Swan, built in 1636. Divers also took measurements and photos to make a photogrammetric 3D model of the wreck, and they're hoping to use all of this information to track down more about the ship in the written record. A shipwreck in the Southern Irish Sea, previously believed to be a submarine, has been identified as the HMS Mercury, which was a minesweeper during World War II. It had originally been a ferry, and it sank in 1940 after being damaged when one of the mines that it was trying to clear exploded. The mine had gotten caught in the vessel's sweeping gear and exploded underneath the vessel. This work was carried out by maritime archaeologists at Burnmouth University and scientists at Bangor University School of Ocean Sciences. It's part of ongoing work to try to identify hundreds of wrecks in the Irish Sea. Archaeologists working in the Adriatic Sea have confirmed that a shipwreck discovered there a few years ago is both the oldest and the best preserved ship in the area, And it's a somewhat surprising find as well. It's in water that is only about two and a half meters deep, but it was not spotted until just a few years ago. Slovenian archaeologist Milan Eric found it by accident while anchoring a boat in Croatia, and research started on it back in 2018. This is a wooden merchant vessel that dates back to about the 2nd century BCE. Research on the vessel required the team to dam off the surrounding area because the sand the vessel was resting in was so loose that it kept refilling behind them as they were trying to dig it out. Once excavation and conservation are complete, the wreck is planned to be housed in the Loshin Museum. And our last shipwreck. Authorities in Finland have retrieved a carved wooden lion's head from a shipwreck on the seafloor. This is pretty unusual. In Finland, shipwrecks are protected. Normally, artifacts are documented through photography and measurements are taken, but otherwise everything stays underwater, sort of similar to that first shipwreck that we talked about, the the 17th century flout. But in this case, the lion's face had fallen off the beam that would have been used to operate the ship's anchors. This beam was called a cat head because it was often decorated with the face of some kind of cat This face had been attached back in 2005 when divers visited the site, but when they went back this year, it had fallen off, and so the decision was made to bring it up. 
All right, now we're going to move on to some other things that are sunken or just otherwise underwater, but for the most part, these are not shipwrecks. So, first up, underwater teams have been working at the sunken city of Tonus Heracleion. The city was initially built on the Nile Delta about 2,700 years ago on small pieces of land connected by bridges and ferries. At one point, it was Egypt's largest port, but it eventually sank due to a combination of factors, including earthquakes, tidal waves, and liquefaction of the land that it was resting on. Parts of the city disappeared around the 2nd century BCE, and then the rest around the 8th century CE. The remains of the city were discovered around the year 2000, and at this point, only about 3% of the area has been explored. Recent finds at the site include a military vessel, which apparently sank while being loaded with huge stone blocks in the 2nd century BCE. Divers also found wicker baskets filled with fruit, particularly with doom, which is a fruit of an African palm tree. These baskets appear to date back to the 4th century BCE, and they may have been part of a funerary offering. The baskets were found in the same general area as a large burial mound that was also home to Greek funerary offerings. A Roman road was found submerged in part of the Venice Lagoon known as Traporti Channel. This doesn't just illustrate one of the areas of the lagoon that used to be accessible by land. It also suggests that there were Roman settlements in the area centuries before the city of Venice was established. This research was conducted using sonar, and they found evidence of 12 structures that would have been aligned along this road. One of the structures may have been a dock, suggesting that this road was situated on a sandy ridge that lay at the time along the lagoon, but now it's under it. Researchers from the University of Bern have dated underwater piles in Lake Orid in the Balkans, believed to be the oldest lake in Europe. This research involved the underwater remnants of about 800 piles, which would have supported the houses and other structures built on the lake. These piles are exceptionally well-preserved, thanks to the lack of oxygen at the bottom of the lake, and the oldest date back to the middle of the 5th millennium BCE. But this site seems to have been used for thousands of years, with settlements essentially being built on top of one another. The remains of these pile dwellings are the only ones from the Neolithic period in this region to be so well preserved, and research done in the area suggests that this was home to Europe's first farmers. Let's take a real quick sponsor break before we move on to some royal residences. Like I said before the break, we've got a couple of finds now that are related to royal residences. First, the Nara National Research Institute for Cultural Properties in Japan has excavated a ruin from the Heijokyo Palace that they believe to have been the residence of Emperor Koken, the female emperor who ruled in the 8th century. They unearthed the footprint of a rectangular structure that was dotted with about 50 pits, These pits would have held the pillars that supported the structure. They believe that this structure was in use for about 20 years. And a team from the Royal Agricultural University and Wessex Archaeology have found an early English cave house dating back to about the 9th century. The cave is cut from sandstone with windows and supporting pillars, and there's some speculation that it belonged to King Eardwolf, who ruled Northumbria until 806 and was later canonized as St. Hardulf. He was buried not far away from the cave house after his death. Moving on to some books and documents. In 2019, Michael Richardson from the University of Bristol's Special Collections Library found seven parchment pieces from a very old manuscript telling the story of Merlin the Magician. These had been used as binding materials for four other volumes that were published around the turn of the 16th century. It's not clear exactly why these fragments were used as binding material, but it was incredibly common to repurpose parchment and paper from books and other materials once they were considered old or obsolete or otherwise no longer needed. 
Reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, These fragments are from an early 13th century old French sequence known as the Vulgate Cycle or the Lancelot Grail Cycle. And it's possible that they were one of the inspirations for Sir Thomas Mallory's Le Mort d'Arthur. It's also possible that Mallory's work is what led to these pieces of parchment being thought of as better suited for the scrap pile than for reading anymore. They may have been seen as more or less obsolete in light of Mallory's work being available. These fragments were dated to the early 1300s, and the text itself was probably written between 1220 and 1225. So this is one of the earliest known copies of this text. In July, an English translation of this material was published as The Bristol Merlin, Revealing the Secrets of a Medieval Fragment. In addition to the translation, this book includes full-color images of the seven parchment fragments. According to researchers at Yale University, a map known as the Vinland map, which is supposedly a 15th century map detailing the northeastern coast of North America, is really a 20th century fake. Yale first announced the discovery of the map in 1965, and from there, people started pointing to it as evidence that the Norse arrived in North America well before Christopher Columbus's 1492 voyage. There were definitely Norse settlements on what's now Newfoundland that predated Columbus's voyage, so the map's inauthenticity does not undo all of that. It also appears that this map was intentionally created to be deceptive. It was made from pages that were repurposed from a 15th century volume called the Speculum Historial. It had a Latin inscription on the back written over bookbinders' instructions about how to bind that volume. This overwritten note contains some instructions for binding the map into the Speculum Historial. It's likely that the forged map was drawn on the Speculum Historial's blank end sheets, and then those were removed and bound into another volume. That was a copy of the Tartar Relation. Both of these volumes were ultimately in the Yale collection, and researchers had access to both of them for as long as they needed to do this research. There were already questions about the map's authenticity before this point, and earlier research had suggested that modern inks were present in at least some parts of the map. But this research examined all of the ink used on the map, finding that it contained a form of titanium dioxide that was not used commercially until the 1920s. They didn't find evidence of the substances that would have been in 15th century inks, like iron, sulfur, or copper. And last up in the the documents and books, a signer's copy of the Declaration of Independence, which was found in an attic in Scotland, was sold at auction in July, with the buyer paying more than $4 million for it. This copy had originally been presented to signer Charles Carroll, and from there it was passed down through family in Scotland before being found by Edinburgh-based auctioneers Lyon and Turnbull. This is one of 201 copies that were commissioned by John Quincy Adams, who at the time was Secretary of State and printed by William Stone, with only 48 of them known to still exist today. It is the last copy known to be in private hands. The buyer was the family of George E. Norcross III, who planned to preserve the document before putting it on display at Independence National Historical Park in Philadelphia. Next up. We have three different finds, all of which are trees, but they are three completely different types of trees. First, research into the family tree of Leonardo da Vinci has traced 21 generations of the family, including five family branches and 14 living descendants. The tree begins with Leonardo's ancestor, Michel, born in 1331, and traces the family's lineage through nearly 700 years. This work has been going on for the last decade. This research contributes to an affiliated project, the Leonardo da Vinci DNA Project, which is an international project with a goal of determining whether remains reported to be Leonardo's really are his. This work could also help confirm whether artwork attributed to Leonardo really was his creation by evaluating any DNA the artist left behind while working on it. And our second tree... An excavation in China's Sichuan province has unearthed a Shu culture sacred tree made of bronze. This tree is truly ancient, dating back to the 11th or 12th century BCE, and it's also really, really intricate. There are flowers, fruits, and a solar wheel ornament 
branching off of a trunk that is held up by a three-legged base. It is so large and complex, and there were so many other ivory artifacts and other items in this same area that it took four months to fully excavate it. At some point, experts will probably try to reassemble it, but right now the priority is excavating the other sacrificial pits that are part of this complex. There have also been other bronze sacred trees excavated from these pits, and it is possible that they all belong to one connected piece. And our third tree find. Researchers at the Tree Ring Laboratory at Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory are studying the United States' old-growth forests by examining the joists and beams that were cut from those old-growth forests and used to build New York City. In this case, they are the ones that were used to build Terminal Warehouse in Chelsea in 1891, which were removed during renovations in 2019. This work has been spearheaded by Edward Cook, head of the Tree Ring Lab, whose other research included studying the timber used to make old houses and a wooden sloop. The timbers they found at Terminal Warehouse include longleaf pine that was at least 150 years old when it was cut, with most of the trees having been cut down in 1891 when the warehouse was built, or not long before that. The oldest of the trees had sprouted all the way back in 1512, and most of them had started growing sometime in the early 17th to mid-18th century. The team compared these timbers to previous research into longleaf pines that are growing today, including stands in the southeastern United States. And they found that the likely source for these specific timbers was eastern Alabama, not far from the Georgia border, maybe even into Georgia, Of course, the oldest wood frame buildings in New York used timber that was way closer to New York, but by the 19th century, most of those forests had been cut down, and New York builders were using wood that came from a lot farther south. They might have even figured out exactly where this lumber came from, suggesting that Sample Lumber Company near Hollins, Alabama, was a candidate. All right, we're ending this installment of Unearthed on the edibles and potables. First, a find near Newport, Pembrokeshire, suggests that people in Wales were farming dairy as long ago as 3100 BCE. Decorated pieces of pottery found there contain residues of dairy fat, possibly butter or cheese, but researchers suggested the most likely source is yogurt. This is the earliest evidence of dairy farming in Wales. I find this next one both fascinating and kind of gross. (laughs) Researchers in Denmark have analyzed the gut contents of a bog body known as Tolland Man. They found barley porridge, flax, seeds, and a small amount of fish, which had been cooked in a clay pot to the point of being slightly burned. I feel kind of, and th- unless this was, you know, what folks actually liked eating, I feel kind of sad that Tall and Man's last meal was kind of burned. Uh, the team, though, said that these gut contents were so well preserved that they could probably recreate the recipe for this meal if they wanted. Isotope studies into the remains of people who died in the seaside town of Herculaneum when Vesuvius erupted in 79 CE have added more detail to what researchers already knew about their diets. Earlier archaeological work had uncovered evidence of fish, shellfish, olives, cherries, peaches, lentils, and beans. But these isotopic studies suggested that nearly a quarter of the protein in these people's diets came from fish. That's about three times more than the typical diet of people living in the area today. And more than 10% of their calories came from olive oil. That lined up with previous estimates that Romans' diets contained about 20 liters of olive oil annually. Some of the news coverage of this research made me laugh really hard. (laughs) Because instead of framing it like what we just said, it was more like uh, people in the ancient... Roman town of Herculaneum ate a lot of fish and olive oil. And I was like, no, really? Really? Are you telling me people on a coastal town in a place that is known for its olives are eating fish and olive oil? What? Uh, The research was a lot more specific and interesting than that. And also, there was some suggestion that people's diets varied according to their gender, with men generally eating more cereals and seafood than women did. 
this was not universally true among every single set of remains that they studied. And it's also not clear exactly what might have led to this difference. It could have been something as simple as men being more directly involved in fishing and eating some of their catch to sustain themselves while they were at it. Moving on to a potable, researchers in China have found evidence of some of the earliest known beer consumption, probably done as part of rituals to honor the dead. This came from a study of 9,000-year-old pots from a mound that contained two human skeletons, as well as pits containing pottery vessels. Some of the vessels were painted and may also be some of the earliest known painted pottery in the world. Seven of the vessels found at the site were long-necked pots that were known to be used to drink alcohol in later eras. So to confirm that these earlier pots were also used for the same purpose, researchers tested the residues inside them. They found starches, molds, and yeast, which lined up with residues from fermenting beer. In this case, the beer was probably made from fermenting rice, grain, and tubers. And for our last food find, and our last find for this installment of Unearthed, remember that thermopolium we talked about last year? That hot food kiosk in Pompeii that was decorated with pictures of mallards, a rooster, and a dog? And a dog that I was worried about, but everybody said it was okay. Uh, Well, it opened to the public for viewing in August. So we can all go see the dog and know that he was protecting the food. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Once international travel is a little safer than yes. it seems to be right now. Uh, so that's our unearthed for October. We'll be back with some more of this. I am anticipating that the year in unearthed will probably not be the very, very first two episodes in January just because of how at this moment it looks like our year end time off is going to fall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so same thing happened, I feel like, this year. Probably will happen again. So do not fret if the very first episode of January is not unearthed and you're really looking forward to it. It will be a long, very It's coming. It is. Uh, And I have an email from Lizzie. Uh, And this is another email about Aleister Crowley. Uh, Lizzie wrote to say, Hello, my dear historians. Always delighted to have a new episode, and I had my finger on the trigger to write you over Bodium, but then you went even more local to me, and this is something I know from local lore. Mr. Alistair Crowley is said to have cursed our dear town of Hastings. I believe he was educated here for a while, and this might have even been where he was ill as a child. In any case, just to go with the way it's told and not to cite sources or look anything up, just to serve up oral history folklore to you direct from Hastings, he left, traveled all over the world, had all of his hedonistic adventures and wizard battles and what have you, only to end up back in dear old Hastings, an old and sick man, When he died here, he declared something to the effect of, once you stay in Hastings, you die there. I interpret it as something more akin to talking about his own condition, but he was so frightening to people, I can imagine talking of this curse could easily go from talking about himself feeling cursed, maybe as a result of one of those magic battles, who knows, or what have you, to it seeming to be a declaration on the town itself. The town is really lovely, and I can imagine people would return here to live in retirement, so who knows? I certainly haven't escaped it yet. The sad thing is there was a pub on the site of the home he died in, but it was recently demolished. I leave a small gatehouse building remains and maybe the site of his death, and the pub was in the main house set further back from the road and just enjoyed the notoriety for its marketing. I've heard a lot of accounts of it, and despite being something of a folklore scholar and really enjoying digging into the history of other places and stories, this one is so close to home, as in my roots to and from places I will literally go past that building very regularly. I rather enjoy keeping it all a mystery and living in this folkloric moment. Anyway, I thought this might give you a smile to know the people of Hastings still talk about his curse regularly, and his memory very much lives on here, Lizzie. I love this story. <laughs> I would also probably be reluctant to go try to dig up whether a particular piece of local lore was really a true thing or not. Uh, if you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. 
We're also all over social media at Missed in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app and wherever else you like to get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.